Hello, good morning. Welcome to the Symptoms.Wiki YouTube channel. I'm joined by Linda Ellisgood. Linda is founder of the LDN Research Trust, which was set up in the United Kingdom as a registered charity in 2004 um, and is the editor of the LDN book. Linda was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in August of the year 2000, and she started LDN therapy in December of 2003, and now has a much better quality of life and hope for the future. So through the LDN Trust, Linda has connected with thousands of patients and connected these patients with doctors and pharmacists worldwide and provided lots of information and patient stories about L L LDN. I'm, of course, Sean Moses, curator of symptoms.wiki. Linda, what an absolute pleasure and honor to have you with us today. Thank you for joining. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Your health journey has been simultaneously, for me, one of the most fascinating and uplifting stories I've ever heard. I'll just be so grateful if you could just kind of share it, um, you know, with our audience. You know, how did you how did you manage to to find out about LDN? What what motivated you in that direction? Would you like me to just first of all explain the position I was in health wise yeah. before finding LDN? Absolutely, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, so um, at the, <laughs> before getting sick, I thought I was Wonder Woman. I could do everything, anything, fit everything into the day. You know, if you want something done, you ask a busy person because they will they will do it. Um, my husband was working away. I had two children. I was the taxi. I cooked. I cleaned. I worked full time. I did the decorating, the gardening. I was on the top of my game. Okay. And Christmas 1999, my mother had a heart attack and the trauma and stress of that led to what we now know was a, a, an MS relapse. Now, I had had peculiar things happen to me since the age of 13 when I had very bad glandular fever. I had nearly a year off school, which then led to what we would call now chronic fatigue syndrome. But they were episode. Uh, once I got over the glandular fever, it took about 18 months and I was back to where I should be. But from then on, I used to have episodes of funny things, parts of me going numb or weak or, but because they were never an issue, they never stayed long enough for me to think mm. this is a problem. They were just incidents that came and went. But when my mother had this heart attack, the trauma of that was very close to my mother, really knocked me off balance. Um, I started having more numbness, weakness, and I was just sick, getting really, really sick. And fatigue was a really big problem. So this was the Christmas. By Easter, I was fed up of not feeling well. And I said to my husband, if I go away for a week with the youngest daughter, I wanted him to come, but he was working. But just go away and then come back and I'll be fine. I will leave, you know, I'll, I'll have broken this cycle of being ill. Of course, that's not what happened. Um, we went to Portugal. It was meant to be hot and sunny at Easter and it was cold, wet and windy. And the, the rain was hitting my left-hand side of my face. And believe it or not, the rain made my face go numb. So oh, I wow. thought, okay. um, you know, it was numb. And I was very, very cold. I was tired. And I said to my husband, I think I'm going to have to go to the doctors when I get home. So um, I saw my doctor who said I needed to see a neurologist who I couldn't get to see until August. So it was a long wait. So in between that time, I wasn't having any relapses. I was just deteriorating all the time. So what I could do one day, then I couldn't. I lost my hearing in my left ear. I had double vision. The left-hand side of my body, you could draw a line down it. And the left-hand side was numb with pins and needles. 
not numb where you didn't feel anything. It was a numb that really, really hurt. And just oh to God. put a sheet over me or anything was painful. It sounds ridiculous. Um, I lost my bowel and bladder control. I had very bad vertigo. My left leg was like you could turn it on and off with an electric switch. I could be standing and then all of a sudden I would drop because my leg strength would go. So this continued and I saw the neurologist in August, at which time I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't see because of the double vision. I hadn't got clarity of mind cognitively. It was terrible. And I'd lost the hearing in my left ear. Now, he wanted to do some tests to discover what was wrong with me. He needed to diagnose me. So I had 28 different blood tests for tropical diseases and everything you can think of. Um, evoke potential tests on my eyes and my ears. Mm -hmm. I had a MRI scan and I had a lumbar puncture. And while I was waiting for the doctor to come and tell me the verdict of all these tests, a nurse came along and she said to me, oh, she said, how long have you had MS? So oh, I said, wow. MS, I haven't got MS. Oh, I must have the wrong patient. And then the doctor, came, the consultant okay. came in and told me I'd got MS. And I thought, I, mm, I, th I thought probably I had. Okay. So he gave me a three day course of intravenous steroids. Okay. And he then gave me a second MRI. And he said that he was very concerned that I was going to end up deaf and blind. So you can imagine that puts you in one awful spin. Of <laughs> and uh, he said he would have to give me, even though they only like to give these intravenous steroids um, every two years, I was going to have to have another one. So um, I had another course. Well, it didn't work. And I blew up and I was red like a tomato. I mean, I was just terrible and, and sent home. So I was at that point having a relapse every three months. And if you think of the level I was at here, every relapse I dropped, okay. I would drop three rungs of a ladder. I would then slowly get back up to um, two rungs. I would go back up to to drop another three so all the time my level was dropping i was deteriorating mm -hmm. that quickly so by um october 2003 i saw my neurologist who said to me he did lots of different tests um, and by this time i had cognitive problems i was choking on my food mm -hmm. my memory was terrible i couldn't remember anything I would put a sentence together in my head, but what I thought I was saying wasn't actually what I was saying. It didn't come out making any sense. Um, the numbness, the pins and needles, twitching muscles, restless legs, burning limbs. Um, the hearing was still gone. The double vision was still there. The vertigo. I mean, I couldn't do anything for myself. I didn't know where my mouth was. So to put a cup to my lips, somebody would have to help me because I was you know, moving it all over the place. It was awful. And he examined me and said to me, I'm terribly sorry, but you're secondary progressive MS now and there's nothing more we can do for you. Oh. And as he was saying that, he opened the door to show me out. That's and incredible. I felt as though he may as well have said, go home, die quietly, you're an embarrassment because we can't, we can't do anything. So... Um, from there, um, I did contemplate ending it all, and I am a very positive person, but the state of mind that I was in at that point, um, my parents, my mother survived, my, my parents would keep saying, if only we could take it from you, we've had a good life, we'd rather have it. My children, my husband, we didn't do things as a family because I was the mum in the bed who couldn't move. I was stopping everybody's life. I was halting it. They weren't able to enjoy their lives because of me. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, long story. But anyway, I'd got this new pill bottle of heavy duty pain medication, which I used to take. Um, it. 
it was a trade-off. The pains used to be so bad. I had bad pains in my head, really, really bad pains. I could take the tablets and then felt nauseous, so nauseous I couldn't move because I thought I was going to vomit. So it was a case of, do I want the really bad pain that I couldn't stand or did I want the really bad nausea I couldn't stand? So mm. I only ever took the painkillers when I couldn't stand it anymore because the trade-off wasn't really worth it. Okay. So I'd got these painkillers and I was on my own and I thought it's the only way of releasing everybody from mm. this situation. But then it was a case of who was going to find me. It was going to be my 15 year old daughter. Now, I couldn't do that to her, you know. Um, so the only thing I could do was to prove everybody wrong that there was something that could be done. I just had to find it. So this was in uh, 2003, okay. and I could only function sitting on a chair for 10 minutes. That that was it, and I'd have to sleep for three or four hours after doing that. The internet wasn't as it is today. It was very – there were chat rooms in those days. There wasn't Facebook or uh, even web browsers didn't – search engines rather didn't actually come up with much but i managed to find um a, a group of people from america um i knew i wasn't unique i knew there must be other people out there similar to myself and i was told about ldn and they said to me if it doesn't do you any good it won't do you any harm hey did i care if it had possible horrible side <laughs> effects because there was nothing else i could try but of course. It, was, it was harmless and um i managed to find a doctor a dr bob lawrence in wales who's sadly passed now um he gave me the information and he said to take it to your own doctor and see if they'll prescribe it unfortunately they wouldn't but my new doctor said to me that if i could get somebody to prescribe it for me she would monitor me. So I felt as though I wasn't flying solo, that I had somebody on on my team, as it were. Good. So I went back to Dr. Bob Lawrence and he very kindly prescribed it for me and my doctor monitored me. Now, I was told that you could have introductory side effects, you could have worsening of pre-existing symptoms, headaches, stomach issues, vivid dreams, disturbed sleep. I wanted all of those symptoms because I wanted to know it was working. It was working, <laughs> of course. And it did nothing. <laughs> I was so disappointed. It did absolutely nothing. When I say absolutely nothing, I think I actually slept better from okay. the start because my sleep was very, very poor. Okay. And I was very disappointed because I thought it's not going to work for me and I didn't find anything else that I could try. So where do we go from here? But I stuck with it and... After three weeks, cognitively, it was amazing. Mm. Um, it's like looking at a, a muddy puddle and somebody dropping a little bit of bleach in it and it clears the water. That's how mm. it was in my head. It was amazing. Incredible. And as it went on, the hearing and the eyesight and the cognitive problems, living in my head was similar to living in a television set that wasn't tuned in. And it was as if somebody had turned all the knobs and connected it. And it was like, whoa, you know, I can think, I can process things. You know, I can understand what other people are saying. And the plus point was they could understand what I was saying. Great. And that was such a big deal just to right. feel as though you, you've got a little bit of you back, you know, oh. after having lost who you were completely. Because at that point, I wasn't able to achieve anything. I had no control over my bowel or bladder. I had no control over what I did. All I did was survive from morning till night with other people helping me. I didn't actually do anything for myself. So that was amazing. But it took 18 months. Um, it didn't all happen at night. Um, getting out of a wheelchair, I know after having been in bed, so long um i was in bed for about 18 months and in a wheelchair where i wasn't 
actually using my legs that much. When I started walking, I had terrible pains at the backs of my legs up from my um, ankle up until my calf muscle. And I actually went to see a podiatrist at the hospital. Now, when you haven't got very good balance and they tell you to stand against the wall and hold the wall, okay. he didn't quite understand the fact I wasn't really able to do that. But he ran his thumbs up the, the backs of my legs and, and he said, does it hurt here? And he pressed. Oh, my goodness, did that hurt? And the problem I'd got with trying to walk um, my tendons had shrunk and, and that's what he was discovering but it hurt on the insteps of my feet mm -hmm. so it was so painful to try and walk so you had to do stretching exercise of those tendons to get them cool. loose again to be mm -hmm. able to walk so I, I find it amazing when people say that they've been in a wheelchair for years and just get up and walk how did they manage that mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't do it but it, it took time. And when I first started to walk, I could walk like six steps and then it had to be seven steps, eight steps and just, you know, building things up. And my hearing um, came back probably 90 percent. Um, double vision, I have to have prisms in my glasses. Mm -hmm. But the very nice young lady who did my vocal potential tests, she could um, see that I was getting upset that the tests were so poor. Um, this is when the um, consultant thought that I was going deaf and blind. Okay. She said to me that um, because my left ear on the test showed absolutely nothing, and she did it three times because she said that they would call it um, system failure. Okay. And the second time was the same so she did it a third time but she said to me in the brain there are so many redundant nerves that quite often uh, another nerve will reroute itself from oh, the yeah. ear um which it must have done so Fantastic. i was very pleased she gave me some hope even if it hadn't have worked she made me feel there was a possibility that something could uh, could work because she wasn't really meant to do that, but I really mm. appreciated it. Um, my sight was terrible, and I still, if I don't wear my glasses, it's still not good. But cognitively, we're good. Bowel and bladder is good. Fantastic. Um, it has been. I. Mm. So, what did I want to do with all this information For sure. that I had done? Did I want to say, okay, I'm fine? I now and carry on with my life as before or did I want to help other people and it was it was a no-brainer um I can see financially it was a really good move for me um because I I've never been paid since I, I started the charity so mm -hmm. it was a case of okay I want to tell everybody about LDN who were in that deep dark place that I was in I, I want them to know that there is some hope. There is something you can try. It's not a miracle drug. It's not a cure. It doesn't work for everyone, but it is really, really well worth trying. So Fantastic. that's what happened with uh, the charity being set up. And we managed to, well, I managed to get lots of um, doctors on board, not only um doctors but consultants dermatologists gastroenterologists pain specialists um rheumatologists the list goes on people at the top of their field and um, who can't be mocked for not knowing what they're talking about of so course. on the website we are all about science-based facts there have been hundreds of small trials and studies on LDN. They're on the website. Information packs, absolutely everything, past conference materials. And we want people to know that the information that we're putting out there is factual and correct because the internet is absolutely full of misinformation as well as <laughs> good information. 
<laughs> it, it, it is. You're, you're completely right. I mean, w- what a powerful story. Uh, I mean, there's so much to unpack. So, but, but I guess what I took out of it as a former uveitis patient, so I've struggled with autoimmune diseases myself in the past, um, was that when I heard about LDN, one of the first things I did was that I then Googled and I searched, you know, LDN with uveitis. And for those who are just kind of wondering what is LDN, it's low dose, sorry, low dose naltrexin. So I, I Googled LDN uveitis and uveitis being an ocular condition that I used to suffer from, from the recurrent version of it. I then began to see patients had been using LDN. They, they'd managed to somehow get prescriptions and for some of these patients, I mean, the ones that I came across online, it was putting their uveitis into remission. Uh, you know, that, that that was fantastic. And I'd never heard about it. My doctor had never brought it up, you know, so, but, but, but I guess that the first question that I would love to ask is just, you know, how did you become your own advocate? Because what I'm hearing is that the, the, the medical system had all, almost just kind of given up on you. And you had to really say, okay, what do I need to get better? So could you just just kind of walk us through the process? When you began to search for, for LDN, at what point did you take on the advocacy of your own health? And what obstacles did you come across? How, how did you overcome some, some of those obstacles? Okay. I think until you're sick, you believe that the health system is there and that whatever is wrong with you, you go and tell your doctor, he sends you to hospital, you see a consultant and they have the magic (laughs) to put you right. And sadly, more often than not, with many conditions, that is not the case, especially autoimmune conditions. There isn't um, an answer, basically. So you have to take ownership and responsibility of your own condition. I did miss out. Um, I was put on Rebif, um, which is an interferon drug, um, quite a while after being diagnosed. It must have been about a year, something like that. Um, And I took it for eight months. And before you start, you have to have a liver function test. And my liver function test showed it was absolutely normal. Three months afterwards, my liver function test was in the red. And my consultant said to me, don't worry, it will settle down. Mm -hmm. Six months later, uh, three months later, it was even further in the red. Now, it was making the interferon drug was making me very, very sick. Um, I was seeing a gastroenterologist, I was seeing a gynecologist, I was seeing a urologist. My internal organs weren't working properly at all. And my um, gastroenterologist said, whatever is your neurologist doing, he should take you off this medication. He's doing irreversible damage. And alarm bells just went off in my head and it was, I was thinking, no, it's my body. I don't mind you talking to him. He can say, stop it, take it, whatever, but I'm not taking it anymore. I know it's my body. And and that was a wake up call of me saying no. And I spoke to my doctor and said, I'm not taking it anymore. And she said, well, you must write a letter and tell him you're not taking it anymore, which I did. But that was so empowering, mm. um, realizing that you you do have a say, you don't have to go along with their recommendations. Yeah. And I say recommendations, you, you, it's not setting stone, it's not law, you're not forced to agree to anything. You can you can say no. And I didn't realize until that eureka moment that you can say no so then it was a case of as I said it was very empowering it was I have the ability now to make my own choices my own decisions on my health 
so and that was what led me to the google searches to finding these people who were taking ldm great that, that, that that's so powerful one of the things i always say to people with an autoimmune disease is that you really have to keep two things in mind the first is that the medical doctors number one are not scientists so you get a couple of physician scientists but that's not the norm what a medical doctor is primarily there to do is to get you a diagnosis and prescribe pharmaceutical drugs and in some patients that process is enough to get them better like you know so uh, i i don't think i could say factually that it doesn't help a lot of people that the reality is that some people do get their diseases stabilized i, I did not with the pharmaceutical drugs but there are some lucky few out there um, I, i've met people who've been on methotrexate for years and their liver uh, enzymes are perfect so their renal functions perfect i took it in about six months in i i had serious trouble my uh, renal function was absolutely terrible and my liver enzyme just kept on rising so you know but for sure my body was not processing it but yeah so people have i think a mistaken view of what their doctors can actually do for them when they have a serious chronic illness when you have a one-off illness perhaps some kind of you know accident and emergency but the medical system is kind of fit for purpose but a lot of patients and i guess like like yourself and myself who aren't helped by these medicines the, what the medical system tends to do is just more of the same so the medicines haven't helped here's some more and and at one point you just have to really and this is something i had to come to terms with just say okay i have to take utter responsibility for my well-being this individual has you know the uh, they have prescribing power, they're a medical doctor, but ultimately they cannot care about me as much as I can. I have to really take that responsibility. And the first part of taking that responsibility, I, I always say to people, is find other people who have been through what you're going through. The reality is that thankfully, we humans are not that unique. If you're going through a serious health crisis, thousands of other people have suffered the same thing thankfully and some of them have beaten it go and ask them what they've done that literally is it that's the first part of the process find people who've done the same who've been through the same process and are now better they will tell you what they did and be open-minded some of the things they've done are completely out of the box and you may say hey this is not for me but be open-minded uh, open-minded enough to have that dialogue would you agree with that that that's like you know the first kind of point of call be be curious go and search go and speak to other patients also that we we don't focus on in this country is diet yes i mean certainly. diet is is really really important for example that i know many people who have been very very sick who become couch potatoes who haven't been watching their diet and they've eaten fast food food with the high calorific value but without any actual goodness in it sure. um, but if you don't fuel your body correctly you, you can't expect it to run correctly exactly um, and i once mentioned it to a doctor what I was dairy free, gluten free. And she said, why are you doing that? And I was just stunned. <laughs> A doctor asking me why I was changing my diet. But we don't focus on that. I mean, in America, all the naturopathic doctors are into finding the root causes. Now, this is what we tend to fail to do in this country. We Certainly. would rather put a Band-Aid over the symptoms rather than looking for what is causing those symptoms. That is a, a really big key. And you will find that most people with an autoimmune disease has very high levels of inflammation. Certainly. And certain foods cause more inflammation. So, you know, you've just got this vicious 
cycle going on of all this inflammation that causes so many symptoms. And the, there are doctors that use supplements and herbs and all this kind of thing, which reduces the inflammation, which even before they find LDN, their inflammation levels have come down and a lot of their symptoms are a lot better. And that's all done naturally. Mm. You know, it's it's quite amazing. But if you go back in time when they had witch doctors, etc., where we were using food as medicine, using plants and things, and I think there might be a shift in that way of thinking yeah. in um, times to come, hopefully, rather than having um, medications that have potentially high side effects. For example, I've known many people on um, with fibromyalgia who've been on 14 to 20 pharmaceutical medications a day for different treating different symptoms and pain, etc. And once they get on to say four or five or six medications, each medication carries a list and some of them uh, are extensive of potential side effects. Normally you don't get them, but they have to list them. Yeah. But once you start to take a cocktail, the chances of you getting a side effect becomes higher. Absolutely. But when you get a side effect, you're told that doesn't matter. We've got this other pill that will combat yeah. these side effects. So then you take another pill to combat those. Then you carry on extending the cocktail until mm. you need another pill to contact, uh, counteract the new side effects. It's unbelievable. Okay. But many of those people who then find LDN, change their diet, take some supplements, and we're all deficient in vitamin D these days, they can drop their medications to zero to like four rather yeah. than taking a, an enormously long list of pharmaceutical medications. And of course, it's so much better for your system. Absolutely. You're completely right. The way I always describe it is that we've been educated to see healthcare as something a doctor does to us. So we go into a doctor's office and a doctor hands you let's say a pill or a prescription and you take those pills and that is what we now consider healthcare but you are completely right that actually part of your healthcare is how you nourish yourself i remember when i when i was initially diagnosed with uveitis i was on a lot of steroid medication and you know i just simply googled the uh, sorry the the, the consequences of using these steroid medications, I looked at them, I, I, I was pretty, pretty horrified. So I went back to the doctor and said, hey, um, I, I'm not expected to be on this for very long. And the doctor said, well, you know, maybe if you keep on getting flare ups, I said, well, OK, but this is going to give me other things which can blind me. So it's possibly going to trigger a glaucoma at some point. It, it's definitely going to trigger, a, you know, cataracts. It's definitely going to trigger at one point with sufficient use, uh, adrenal fatigue. And the doctor just didn't seem that concerned. So I, I thought, okay, well, perhaps I'm missing something here. Perhaps the risk is lower. So I looked at the National Library of Medicine PubMed and I saw the, the, the kind of, you know, what are the risks of me actually getting these? And I said, look, for me, this is unacceptable. And also it, it was a very kind of cavalier approach that the doctor had with me because the doctor said, well, if you get a glaucoma, we have other medicines. And I said, well, then I'm on those medicines for life. So, <laughs> I mean, so the, 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 the steroid medication, hypothetically, it's, you know, limited use. So it's temporary, but the glaucoma medication, I have to use it so the day I leave the surface. I said, absolutely not. And it just triggered in me a, a kind of almost like a survival instinct to, to get out of that system as, you know, as quickly as possible and just to really be in the driver's seat and, and say, OK, what I need here is information uh, for sure. I can't just randomly go to Bar you know, Holland and Barrett's or to a health food store and just randomly buy different supplements. What, what, what I primarily need is to find out how have other people gotten better? And to your point there about the naturopaths, I really do 
wish everybody with a chronic autoimmune condition goes to see a naturopath, not, not suggesting that it's going to be a magic pill in every situation, but what it will do, it, it shifts your mentality because you go from seeing healthcare as something somebody does you know, to you to realizing you have to find the root cause. Every illness has a root cause. Try and find the root cause. You're halfway to treating if you can find the root cause. And then the thing that your naturopath will not accept it is having you as a patient when you have a poor diet, they're going to make you clean up your diet. And you're completely right. That tackles some of the inflammation, not that it solves it completely in every patient, but it gets you some of the way it gets you those small, easy wins. And those are so critical for just you keep keeping in the fight. You know, if your symptoms are a little bit less bad, you have that renewed optimism, you know, the hope, you know, we, we can do this. And, and ultimately, you need that. Mm -hmm. So I, I would love to find out, I mean, how does one bring up the, the topic of, you know, low dose uh, naltrexone with a doctor? Is that an easy discussion to have? Or is that the kind of discussion that would get us marched out of the doctor's office, you know, okay, pretty quickly? It, it depends on your doctor. Okay. If your doctor has done a turn in A&E, emergency medicine, they know that they use naltrexone to, after an operation to get people off the opioids to clean up their system. They know that it's the opposite of an opioid. Okay. They know that it's been trialed in doses of 300 milligrams a day back in the 70s and only felt harmful in 300 milligrams a day doses okay. to the liver. Other than that, you know, they know it's a safe drug. So those doctors are really open to it. They don't, okay. don't mind prescribing it. Um, there are actually, I think, a couple of thousand, maybe more now, of doctors that are prescribing it in the UK on the NHS. Now, people will say to me, so who are these doctors? We're not allowed to say who they are, GDPR, okay. but, you know, data protection rules and, and everything. For sure. But even if your doctor won't prescribe it for you, that even if you don't live in the middle of nowhere, similar to what I do, there are other doctors you could probably move to. Okay. So I always say it's worth asking okay. before you go down the private route. If any doctor that you could transfer to if they are taking on new patients if they would prescribe LDN for you. I live in a village and I know there are people 10 miles north of me who get an NHS prescription. There are people 10 miles south of me who get an NHS prescription but I'm too far from, from both to become a patient so I have to pay for mine. But I think it's a small price to pay to be able to function. But we have on our website LDN guides and the 2022 guides are still current. There is a patient guide, there's a prescriber guide and a dosing protocol, protocol guide. So I always suggest that people print these out, go to your doctors and say, you know, I'd like this prescribed for me. Can I leave it with you? Could you give it to the doctor and then make an appointment to go back and um see them to discuss if they are willing to prescribe LDN. And I am always of a mind that if you're doing something and LDN is a drug, admit it, it's a very, very low drug and it's not harmful, etc. But why hide it? If you do go down the sure. private route, you tell your doctor that you are taking LDN. It, yes. It's not a dirty secret or anything you know it's absolutely fine but i think it should be recorded that you are taking ldn because a lot of people say but i don't want my doctor to know but that's their choice but i always think honesty is the best policy and you can't go wrong if you've told people what you're taking i i agree i guess the other thing i'd love to find out um now your experience has been with ms uh, I've seen LDN used, uh, and I've come 
come into contact with people who've used it for uveitis successfully. Is that the range of illnesses or are there other illnesses okay. that that we should keep in mind? Yes. Any illness that has an autoimmune component is, okay. is possible. Okay. We've got a list of over 400 different oh, conditions. Incredible. So, so, so I'm not RA, Crohn's. Those, yeah. Okay. Ulcerative colitis, okay. psoriasis, eczema, asthma. Rosacea, you know, I'm guessing. Yeah. And fertiligo as well. And for children, for example, um, autism, uh, juvenile Crohn's, juvenile arthritis, you know, eczema, asthma, all of these kind of things. Women's health, polycystic ovaries, endometriosis, Incredible. painful periods, heavy periods, cancer, um, chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And the, that's there are so many. Fibromyalgia, for sure chronic pain, um, regional pain syndrome, uh, but many of the autoimmune conditions have a pain component to it as, as well. I mean, MS, you can get terrible pains, of you know, course. Crohn's pains. You know, if you look hard and you ask any of these people with uh, autoimmune disease, do you have any severe pain? The answer is mainly yes. Absolutely. Obviously, in different basis of the body but it's also used in infertility clinics to help regulate the woman's cycle and um, cancer as i said mental health issues absolutely amazing um even drug resistant um bipolar dep you know, depression and um, can be helped with ldn disassociative uh, syndrome which is terrible um has shown to work it takes longer um alopecia now there are certain conditions that take longer. Dermatologically, it can take much longer before you notice anything. You know, it could be six months. It could be 10 months. You have to stick with it. And the answer to potential side effects, um, when I started, it was take three milligrams for a month, then go up to 4.5. End of. That was the protocol. But now we know that people with fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, that um, those people are ultra sensitive to drugs, any drug. Yes, and they have sure. to start much, much lower. So we, we're talking it could be 0.5, could be 0.2 and, and work up. There is also what they call microdosing LDN, which is absolutely fascinating to me. People who are drug addicts, not through choice. I'm talking drug addicts that have had an accident um, in the past and they have been given opioids. Your body gets used to the opioids, but that doesn't matter because you can keep increasing the opioids until you've taken the maximum of that opioid, but then they can give you another painkiller alongside of your original one. It is so scary how easily these people have become addicted to prescription medications. For sure. Now, by using a microdose of LDN, and we're talking 0 0.001, a fraction of a grain of sugar, I mean, it is so, so, so tiny. It makes the opioids more effective, which mm. means you can start titrating those opioids down. Because a lot of these people on these heavy-duty opioids their pain is still a nine or a 10 a day, which is mm. the maximum on the scale, but it's they've stopped working. So mm. it kicks them in to start working. And you have this microdose of LDM, which could be 0 0.001. And slowly you can titrate the opioids down while increasing the LDN or the microdosing of LDN up. And they don't have withdrawal effects. Great. I have spoken to hundreds of people. I, honestly, it, it blows me away that these heavy duty medications, they're still in pain. And after several months of working with a pain specialist, and I would say nobody must do this at home without working with a, a doctor because you can go into withdrawal. It needs to have somebody knowledgeable. But sure. they can get them off the opioids and they 
their pain, they tell me, some of them tell me it's zero, that they don't feel pain anymore, or a three or a four where they're aware of the pain, but it mm. doesn't stop them from carrying on with their day-to-day -day living, which I find it, it's like tickling something with a feather, you know, instead of hitting it with a hammer, you're <laughs> tickling it with a <laughs> and it works. So that's, a, I mean, that's wonderful. Absolutely amazing. I mean, arthritis, a rheumatoid arthritis yes rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease and i had people years ago saying to me i'd like to try it for osteoarthritis well that's where your joints have worn it's not yeah, autoimmune. Sure. you know your your bone is rubbing on bone and you know i i don't think ldn is going to work i used to say but so many people tried it and pain specialists prescribe it for all sorts of pain now but this lady had um it was in her coccyx, so at the base of her spine, had worn. And when she sat, it was bone on bone and she couldn't oh, sit. She couldn't agony. lay down. Yeah, oh. it was awful. And you can find the interview. It's online on uh, Vimeo and YouTube. But she took LDN and it worked for her. That's incredible. Uh, and I was I, I, amazed. I, I've read up on a couple of uh, cases where... It, uh, you know, for example, an individual has, let's say, uveitis. Um, they take LDN. The LDN helps the uveitis, but it also corrects their dry eye disease as well. Like so, so they did not even intend to really look at the dry eye because they felt the uveitis being more urgent, and that you know the 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 dry eye goes away, and they're seeing clearer than they have in years. And also it put the uveitis into a very, very deep long-term remission pretty rapidly. So th the question that I would love to ask also is, in terms of the microdosing, is microdosing also used in the autoimmune setting or primarily in the addiction, so getting people off opioids? Okay. There are still people that use microdosing who are very, very sensitive to drugs. Okay. to get it into their system I but the, the whole aim is to get them onto ldn it's just a gradual slow i mean the mantra is start low and go slow yes and you've got sure. to find what they call your sweet spot the mm. dose that suits you so you could have 10 people in in a room and someone might find one and a half milligrams is their ideal dose after mm. they've been on it a while some might be two, some might be 4.5, and a few go up to like six. But it's finding that dose that suits you. And you couldn't, just by looking at people or knowing what their background, history, medication, diagnosis, you couldn't tell. Nobody can tell what is. It's a case of trying and finding out what is your dose. And then the other question we get asked is, how long is it going to be before I notice anything? Well, some people say after the first night, they noticed things, they, they slept better, they didn't have the pain or whatever. And then we did a, a survey and some people, it took 15 to 18 months before they noticed anything. Mm -hmm. But in that time, when you've got a progressive disease, if you can stop the progression, but it hasn't helped the symptoms, that's still a win. You're not going that, further. That's huge. Field. Exactly. That, that that, that is huge. So, so sorry, I was just going to say, especially in the case of uveitis, um, if there is something that can potentially stop the rapid destruction of eye tissue, that is a remarkably big win. So, sorry to interrupt. No, it's fine. So if people feel that LDN isn't working, we always say give it 18 months, you know, and decide but nine out of ten who decide that actually it's not doing me any good i'm paying for it or whatever i'm going to stop taking it nine out of ten will restart because it, mm. they will say oh i'd actually forgotten this now hurts this doesn't do as well i don't sleep as well my concentration was better or or whatever it may be but people forget it's very easy uh, and I can remember my mum asking me every day, are you feeling any better? How are you feeling today? 
I had to say to her in the end, please don't ask me because it's depressing me because mm -hmm. it would be another part of me wasn't working properly. Mm -hmm. I knew every day that there was something else wrong with me. Mm -hmm. But when you start to improve, the mind is is funny. You forget that that was ever a problem. It's it's Absolutely. gone. You know, Absolutely. it doesn't hurt or it's not an issue. And you forget about it. And it was the same with me having all these episodes throughout my life from when I was 13. I didn't record it. It happened. It had gone. And it wasn't until you put all the pieces together of the jigsaw puzzle that you see the full picture. Yeah, yes, you're you're completely right. The, the human body has a remarkable kind of capacity to compartmentalize our suffering, and, and you know, in in a good way, because we, we probably wouldn't want to relive. So after we've now healed, you don't want to be able to so easily kind of recall the the absolute agony of that. Um, so I, I guess what I would also love to just kind of walk through is do you have any advice for, for for an individual out there who has a new diagnosis of an autoimmune disorder you know just how should they go about thinking about their healing is there like a mentality or a kind of step sequence they should think about so so for example if you had to do it all over again today um you know would you do certain things first so, you know would you go to the doctor first? Would you go to Google first? You know, could you maybe just kind of walk us through what the kind of stepwise approach? Well, to get a diagnosis, you will have already been to your doctor and consultant. And many people that I've spoken to are very scared and frightened and they don't know what the future holds. I had one young lady contact me. She'd been diagnosed with MS. She was only like 18, didn't know what MS was, didn't know what an autoimmune disease was. She had got absolutely no clue. And when the doctor said to her, um, the consultant rather, said that she'd got um, MS, she said he bent down and opened drawers and rustled some papers and looked at her and because and, she'd said, what does it mean to me? Am I dying? How is it going to affect my life? She mm. had all these questions he was scared and frightened, which mm -hmm. is only natural. And his reply to her was, I don't have my crystal ball with me today. Exactly. Wow. And and she Incredible. just came out and she, she found my number. And this poor young girl, mm -hmm. they didn't give her anything. She just, she just went home and I, I don't know how she found me. She was sobbing. She could hardly mm -hmm. get the words out. She was going... <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. it was her life was at an end and she just hadn't got a clue. Was MS going to kill her? What, was she going to be completely bedridden? She didn't know anything. And I think a lot of people are genuinely scared and frightened and don't know what the future is going to hold. So hopefully when you've been diagnosed, hopefully you'll be given some information sheets which would be handy not necessarily happens i'm told um but there are also access to other services so there are ms nurses very hard to see one um but that is the traditional side of it as you say um you can google now you have to be careful on Google, because there is a lot of misinformation out yes. there. So you have to be very careful. Try and find some charity um, websites or find reputable websites. I mean, even Facebook is uh, rife with misinformation too. I think read as much as you can and try and find the good from the bad from the ugly. <laughs> And find, as you were saying, people who have experienced similar things to yourself. I think you need to be wiser than I was back in the day because there wasn't the internet as it is today. Mm -hmm. There wasn't the minefield um, of um, information overload, which you can get now. Yes, but certainly. Self-help is, is a big 
is a big thing. It, and it, it, ownership. It, it is, it is. The, the way I always like to think about it is that um, if you've worked with your medical doctor for a period of time and you're not getting better with the treatments they've given you, your next best thing is to speak to people who've survived that experience. Um, success leaves clues. These individuals will happily, often for free, tell you what they did and often they will be they will be humble enough to acknowledge that what they have done to heal themselves may not work for you but here is how they went about it and that is of course how you then found LDN speaking to other individuals who had gone through MS and or were going through it and were getting better and they said hey this is LDN it it's not going to make you worse. It's in such low doses that you really have very, very little to lose by, by trying it. And thankfully, you were open-minded enough to give it a go. The, the, the real kind of issue that I've seen, and, and part of the reason I was so motivated to set up Symptoms.Wiki, was that when I started getting good results dealing with my uveitis naturally, I would start to share it with you know people and they would say, well, no, my doctor did not recommend that. And I, I often found they just weren't open-minded enough to try. And, and some of these things were completely free interventions. I wasn't saying go and buy this particular vitamin. Some of it was as simple as do earthing and clean up your diet. And they would say, hey, there's no evidence that diet improves uveitis. And I would say, well, okay. The worst that will happen is that you just eat cleaner for six months. Like, you're not going to lose out because you've now adopted a slightly, you know, fresh vegetables and, you know, different rainbow colored fruits. Now you're eating this instead of eating bread. Like, this isn't going to harm you. But I noticed just such kind of psychological rigidity. And this was a significant factor in stopping people from actually getting better, that they just weren't open to things that other people have done. So, so again, what, one of the things I always say to people is you have to be open-minded. That's not to suggest you accept every bit of information without, you know, critiquing it, but just be open-minded enough to, to, to kind of recognize that you possibly can get better doing things other than the pills your doctor has given to you. Great. Linda, uh, how can people find out about the N LDN charity? Um, how can they support your work? Is do you have a website? Uh, you know, uh, I'd love to share this with people. Okay, so the charity is the LDN Research Trust, and the website is the same. So it's www.ldnresearchtrust.org, and all the information on there is free. There is nothing hidden. Everything's available to everyone, regardless where you are. LDN works in, in three ways, um, just to fill people in. So it was trialled back in the 1970s, late 70s, for addiction. It was used for MS first in 1985 in New York by Dr. Bernard Bahari. It has many, many trials and studies showing the efficacy and safety of naltrexone. Mm -hmm. Now, as we said before, microdosing right up to sort of like six milligrams. What it does, it's an um, opioid antagonist. It, it blocks certain receptors. It helps the body produce more of its own natural endorphins. It works on the toll-like receptors, which um, have an army, as the, Dr. Rachel Allen explained it, that goes and attacks the inflammation in your body. So it reduces the inflammation. And it also works on cell level and helps um, with cancer cells. So it has several... Uh, three different mechanisms of action and it only stays in your body for four hours and then it's gone and it carries on doing its work. That's so. wonderful. 
That is that's um, LDN in a nutshell for you. Wonderful. It, it's really, really excellent because I know some people personally, uh, one, one very, very close friend who is on LDN. And yeah, it's, uh, you know, providing very, very good benefit to her so far. And yeah, I just encourage everybody out there, obviously, to visit the LDN Research Trust website and just to really find out more about LDN for autoimmune diseases and, you know, just to see that it's backed up by a pretty large volume of of rigorous evidence now of lots and lots of patient stories and patient cases and the doctors behind this one cannot accuse these doctors of being underqualified you know in their various disciplines they really understand what they're doing and yeah the, i i definitely uh, encourage everybody to research more, more about it linda it's been such an honor uh, and a privilege to have you with us here today thank you so much for your time and also i'll just like to give a shout out to your book if it's okay you're updating the ldn book could you tell us a little bit about that and when the next edition is going to be available okay well we launched the third volume in okay. november last okay. year so the book is available in many places um ebook as well as um paperback okay. each book is a unique set in the series. So if you think of it like an encyclopedia, so you've got book one that deals with certain conditions, book two, and then we've got book three. And in book three, we have um, COVID, long COVID. We have virally damaged cells. That is a very interesting um, chapter. We have longevity, um, mold, drug oh, resistant wow. depression and there is it's a really uh well informed book and at the back we have references so every statement that's made that um would make people go oh there is science behind it so Wonderful. it's not a, a light read it really is based at medical professionals, doctors and pharmacists absolutely love it. And they they use it as a guide. But as we were saying, going back, who are the experts with these conditions? It's the patients. Exactly. So exactly. patients are like sponges. They want to know all the facts, the figures, the whys, the wherefores. And this is what this book does. But if you are somebody that wants to read a story, the book's not for you because it's a factual deep dive book. And some people, you know, can only read three or four chapters and mm -hmm. there is so much information. They have to go away, absorb that and come back and read some more. So it's not a lighthearted book. It's a heavily information packed book. But as I say, if you have any of those conditions that, the book covers and you are a person that really wants to find out more than it is for you wonderful it's a really really superb resource i was not aware that ldn uh, has you know you know therapeutic potential in mold related illness because um that is one of the illnesses i mean i happen to know a lot of individuals in the mold affected community because initially when I started my own healing journey, I had assumed that mold was a potential cause of my uveitis because I lived in a mold affected building. And th there was just nothing out there for mold patients, uh, you know, at this time. And they fell through the cracks of the medical system, often because the symptoms were just so varied uh, and their medical doctors didn't really have an idea of how to deal with them. So their medical doctors simply stopped taking their appointments. So they they were it was just a real medical limbo, and you know most of them were just simply unable to keep employment. So it's a very very terrible condition. In fact, most of them the, the doctors would not even admit it was a real illness. They were just told consistently, "It's all in your head. It's all in your head." Before they finally got a diagnosis of a mold related illness, 
often through a naturopath who would do all these blood tests. Yeah, so so it's fascinating. And, and perhaps in the future, when you have some time, I, I'd love to have like a deep dive into the potential of LDN for mold related persons, yeah. because th 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 these patients are really suffering. Well, the chapter in the book was written by Dr. Kent Holtoff, and Great. he's one of our medical advisors, but he took the protocol that was used at the time and he found a way of improving it. Great. So he took it and he has rewritten the protocol for mold treatment Wonderful. because the treat the traditional treatment prior to that was quite invasive. Uh, it made yeah, people quite sick initially. But yeah, he the, has the, found the a way. The pulsed antibiotic. They would use the pulsed antibiotics, and it would just obliterate the good bacteria exactly. and make them even sicker. But he's found a way of doing it without making people sick. A much gentler Wonderful. approach of of doing mold. Uh, absolutely unbelievable. And it would be quite good if you could get um, him to talk about. We'll do protocol. I, I, I'll definitely reach out because again, mold illness. Um, so many people suffer from it, and so many people have illnesses that they're unaware are related to mold. You know, so they will get fibromyalgia or they'll get RA, and they'll spend years kind of looking for a cause. The the ultimate kind of inception of this particular disease in the person was living in a mold, in a water damaged building, and so it's a mold related illness. Yeah, so so I'll I'll definitely reach out, and uh, yeah, I'd love to have well, a discussion about that. If you send me your name and address, I'll send you a copy. Hey, thank you. That would be wonderful. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> and and what, what we'll do, we'll put a link to, to the Amazon uh, so people can purchase it, because I, I think it's one of those things that, again, if I, if I was starting on my uveitis journey today, I would absolutely read the LDN book that, that you've written. I think that should be a wonderful starting point for anybody, not just with uveitis, but any autoimmune disorder, in addition, of course, to getting a proper diagnosis, when you start to feel sick, you know, get a proper diagnosis, start to read some of these books. An individual's ability to survive um, a chronic autoimmune condition is so intricately tied to the amount of knowledge they have. Like, so it's just one of those areas where if you really, really understand what is out there in terms of alternative therapies, mainstream therapies that can be repurposed, you stand a much better chance of not only surviving, but keeping your functional status. Because what, what you certainly don't want to do as somebody with an autoimmune condition, let's say, for example, uveitis, is to find the solution after blindness. You know, So, so you, you want to, as quickly as possible, nip it in the bud, just so you can get on with your life. So th that's why I'm so grateful, of course, to you for the work you've done with LDN, because you've saved people years of trial and error, years of research, which I, I frankly had to go, I, I had to try every supplement under the sun, every herb under the sun. Um, I had to go through the psychological kind of thing of thinking something's working, to then find I have another flare up, you know, three, four weeks later. So what you've done and, and why your, your work is so valuable to people with autoimmune disorders, is that you've shortened that time that they don't have to do so much of that legwork. They can pick up a book, they can read it, they can find out more, uh, you know, on your charity's website. So uh, on behalf of all of the patients out there, thank you, Linda. We are very grateful for your help and all of the work that you've put in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Uh, so yeah, it's been a pleasure to have you with us. I'll stop the recording now.